Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, professors from all over the world. It's a privilege to be here. I am on, used to be on the board of MCC, so I am always feel good to be back, warm in my heart. Thank you. Technological competition between China and the US. It's a bit tough for a Monday morning. <laughs> I was thinking about that. Isn't there a lighter topic to talk about Monday morning? Well, anyway, this is the title. In Hungary, we love to think about ourselves, uh, this country and Budapest in particular, as a city and country of bridges. And interestingly, if you look at the shortest distance between Washington, D.C. and Budapest, it's 7,335 kilometers. The shortest distance between Beijing and Budapest is 7,340. So but five kilometers. So Budapest is, I like to think about Budapest is not only as a city of bridges, but a city with wings spreading across from the US to China. So it's, I think it's right and proper to have this conference here and look in both directions and everything that is in between and beyond. Now, in realpolitik, the first order of task is to know yourself, who you are, what is your identity. What is your culture, your way of life? And the second order of task is to understand your adversaries or foes, or for that matter, your friends. What can you expect in times of trouble? Now, there are countless, and I don't need to tell you, seasoned diplomats, academicians, that there are countless ways of comparing countries. I myself, I like simplicity and I love Joseph Nye's concept, who says that when you compare countries, you compare three things. One is the economic might. The second is military might. And the third is culture, what he called soft power back in time. And I think that's a good way of looking at, at countries, in particular when you are asked to give a keynote speech that lasts for 20 minutes. So I try to do that. Economic and military might, as we know from history, can be matched. But cultural might, soft power, is an entirely different ball game. Soft power is not only to be reactive, that is to adapt the changes in the world. It's more than to be active as a nation, to be able to be resilient when changes come, but also to be proactive, that is to be creative and actually influence the future. And we can say that we are victims of technology or users of technology, but the, in the same time, we are creators of the technology. And for example, in artificial intelligence, the big question is whether we control artificial intelligence and use for our purposes or something else is going on. So I suggest that we start with comprehension. And because this is a technological conference, I looked at the chat GPT, what they say about China in general. And there are many uh, things they say. Let's suppose that hopefully everything what the chat GPT sources from the digital cloud is true and not fake news. So chat GPT will give you the following answers. Maybe tomorrow we'll give different ones. 
China is dissatisfied with the current balance of power. And let's pay respect for Henry Kissinger, who just uh, celebrated his 100th uh, birthday. He coined the, or he used several times the balance of power concept. Second, China is the front runner in the international challenge against the US. Third, China is building various excesses of convenience, notably with Russia, to reach her goals. Fourth, China is not a long-term partner to anyone. All of her relations to others are fragile, temporary, futile, and deceptive. And last but not least, and the list is endless, both for China and for the rest of the world, notably for the US, one has to differentiate the powers and capacities of nations and agents, and whether the two coincide. Now let's see what we humble humans with our intelligence can add to that. So what is China? Let me start following the steps of Joseph Nye with the economy. China is a country with extreme geological and climate circumstances. It's regular to have earthquakes, floods, droughts. Just the Sichuan earthquake in 2008 caused death of 90,000 people, devastated 110 square kilometers. Hungary is smaller than that. 10,000 kilometers is like Indiana in the, in the US. And a third of the 15 million inhabitants were left without any homes. So it's devastating. Now in that vast land, you need communication, transportation, telecommunication channels, and that requires huge investments the dams, irrigation system, waterways, requires common projects. Otherwise, a village or a town or a city cannot provide for those infrastructural elements. The Yangtze River Valley from Tibet through Shanghai basically covers 20% of the overall territory of China. In that 20%, 35% of all crops being grown, 70% of the rice, 31% of the forests are located in that 20%. In the delta area of the Yangtze, 10% of the Chinese population live. They produce 25% of the GDP and they are producing 30% of the overall Chinese trade. So it's vast, ecolo ecologically and climate-wise, a very fragile, unpredictable uh, area. Let's talk about one of the most precious resources, water. The water sources flowing from Tibet, cover and give water for 20% of the humankind. The Tibet Plateau is the third largest reservoir of water in the world, besides the North Pole and the South Pole. The Ganges starts here. Yellow River, Yangtze, Mekong, that gives water to Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Irrivadi, that flows to Myanmar, Brahmaputra, that basically covers North India and Bangladesh, and last but not least, the Indus, that provides water for Pakistan. So now we, we start understanding why Tibet is important for the Chinese. 
and why Tibet is a geopolitical tool as well. Just think about Israel and Jordan, the Jordan River. How geopolitical is that? Has been and will always be. And one more fact, South China Sea. The trade on the South China Sea is 50% uh, of the global trade runs through the South China Sea. 40% of the Chinese goods travel on that waterway. 42% of the Japanese trade is conducted on the South China Sea. 14% of the US trade. And from the global crude oil trade, 33% flows through South China Sea and the Malacca Strait. And if we take the LNG, 67% of the LNG. The Japanese ambassador is here. He knows very well that, that uh, the Malacca Strait, the Singapore Strait, and the South China Sea, how important it is for the sheer survival of Japan, or for that matter, South Korea. So the, the, this is how China looks like. Now, what, what are the implications on the on the culture, and culture, I mean not only pictures and music, culture, I mean way of thinking, way of life, and in particular, way of statecraft. How China works, what's in the mind of the Chinese leadership. We usually say that China is collectivist, and it's true. As I mentioned, the ecological circumstances just make it a must that there are collective efforts. You cannot build waterways, harbors, dams by villages. You need a national organization for that. I'm a politician now, but I used to be in business, and I know that the most important thing in business that you have a hierarchy that you can rely on. Now, in China, since the ancient times, one of the most important things is respect for authority and hierarchy. Without that, you cannot build huge uh, projects. The second related issue is the Confucian thinking about family, because family is a hierarchical organization as well. And family and the community is always before the individual ambition. This is what we have to understand in the, in the decision making. For, for an extent, it's true not only for China, but for Japan and, and, and Korea as well. Now, obviously, nothing is perfect. So hence comes the Chinese concept of balance, kind of harmony. They understand that you, you will never be perfect. So you need sufficient solutions. It's similar to what in the Western culture Aristotle claimed when he talked about the golden mean. And he said that courage is a virtue between cowardice and recklessness. You have to stay in the middle. Almost the same time when Confucius lived. And this is where the Middle Kingdom concept is coming. Peace, harmony, balance. And the third element, so respect for authority, respect for family, and the third element is professionalism in organizing. Just give you a couple of examples. The Grand Canal that connects the Yangtze River and the Yellow River is 1,800 kilometers long. The Budapest-Berlin distance is 900 kilometers, so twice as long. And they build it 600 before Christ. And still working. A waterway, trade, people, goods, services. The Great Wall started building in, before Christ, 700. It's 
8,000 kilometers. The distance between Washington, D.C. is 7,300 kilometers. It's 8,000 kilometers. Or let's take the Silk Road that connected Xi'an, the ancient capital of China, and Rome. That is 7,500 kilometers. Approximately the distance between Washington, D.C. and Budapest. And obviously, the, the water route through the South China Sea is a bit longer. So we talked about following Joseph Nye, the ecological and economic circumstances. I'm not an expert in the military stuff. Maybe Professor Goldman will share with you his thoughts. I just wanted to mention one thing, that it's, the, it's an existential interest for the countries in Asia, Korea, Japan, China, that there is a balance of power in the South China Sea, through the Malacca Strait, and through the Gulf. Otherwise, if that waterway is blocked, everybody will be in trouble. And I think this is why in Asia and, and uh, in Indochina as well, Indochinese countries, this is why I, I think this explains why in, in uh, Asia, we feel a kind of stickiness of politics, very slowly changing, because everybody has a big stake in keeping it working. I mentioned that if you want to look at a country, you look at her numbers and compare. Let me give you a couple of comparisons. GDP. Over the last years, the Chinese GDP grew on an average by 6-7%. If you grow by 6-7%, that means that every 10 years, you double your size, double your GDP. Now, the forecast for China is 4 to 5%. So it will take another 15 years till the, the Chinese GDP will double. And no question that it will double. It has now an engine that is driven by the domestic demand. Some 40% of the population is in middle class, at the level of the European middle classes. And second, the exports. In 2021, the US GDP was $23,000 billion. The Chinese was 18, and the European Union altogether was $17,000 billion. US dollars. On a per capita basis, the US is 68,000 US per capita, European Union 48, and China is just 19. Now let's suppose that the population remains the same, but the economy uh, doubles. That means that it will be at around the 40,000 per capita mark. What is very interesting is that they raised 860 million people out of extreme poverty. Extreme poverty means living below $2 per day. Back in, in 1981, 80% of the Chinese people lived below 2%, in extreme below $2 per day. Today, only 0.5% of the Chinese population live under extreme poverty. Now let's think about trade. The US is, in my book, is the strongest country in that sense in the world because the export and import is around 13, 15% of the, of the GDP. So the US can survive even without the export and the import. And we, we usually, we think that, that China is more exposed. But the sheer fact is that the Chinese export is just 18% of their GDP. So they are a little bit more exposed than the US, but not much. And the import is only 14% of the GDP. The US obviously is a, a big partner for China, and, and 
in the US, all the, the, the perception and the, and the strategy always changing. But just recently, Gina Raimondo, the Secretary of Commerce, suggested that the vast majority of trade with China is in benign products, and that will and should continue. So that means that the decoupling is not a, a iron curtain between the two countries, but rather a, a horizontal curtain that there are the benign products and services, and there are the sensitive products and services, and there we have the competition and no trade. Actually, Wang Wentao, who is now the Chinese Minister for Commerce, just left uh, Washington DC in May 25th. He was there meeting with Gina Raimondo. Uh, when we talk about trade and the Russian aggression in Ukraine plays a role, we can say that the trade, Chinese-US trade, is almost $700 billion. The EU-China trade is 900 plus. And with Russia, it's only 190. Only 190 billion. But if we compare it to the really small Russian GDP, it means that Russia really relies on China. If China doesn't buy the gas and oil from Russia, Russia will be in trouble. It's not only the arm trade, it's the energy. The Russians are dependent on China. I'm not a chat GPT, but I understand that the chat GPT give forecast as well. Let me give you a forecast, FDI, foreign direct investment. Right now, the inward investment into the US is about 60% of the US GDP. In the European Union, it's 63%. The inward investment in, to China is only 22% of the GDP. If the overall size of China will be similar to the US nominally, that means that there is a, still a huge market in China. Jamie Dimon just was in, in, uh, in China. JP Morgan has a fully fledged operation there. Last week, Morgan Stanley got a fully fledged license to do brokerage, futures, derivatives, you name it. Wholly owned, not with Chinese partners. And Elon Musk was there, the Tesla, Apple, McDonald's, General Motors, you name it. Everybody is, is there. Now the thing that we have to think about, the outward FDI. In the US, some 43% of the GDP equivalent is invested on abroad. In the European Union, it's 78%. And in China, so investment from China towards the world is just 15. Again, if we think that China will match the US GDP nominally, I would expect them to invest more from the 15% mark towards not the European 78, but at least to the US 43. So I forecast that, that there will be huge direct investment outflow from China in the coming five to 15 years. We know from Mr. Goldman's book, the You Will Be Assimilated, that there are huge investments. Let's take one of the most liberal, but still most uh, strict market in the world, the UK. In 2021, Chinese investment in the UK was more than $100 billion. Interestingly, in the Hinckley uh, nuclear power plant, one of the owners is, is the China General Nuclear Group, 33.5% on the back of the EDF, Electricity de France. Nuclear power plant, Chinese funds own 
10% of Heathrow, the airport. And we remember the UK invested in the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, and still today, the, deputy, the second man there is Alexand Danny Alexander, the former deputy uh, treasurer of the UK government from the Cameroon government. And even in the last two years, between the fourth quarter of 2020 and third quarter of 2022, US investment in China exceeded $100 billion. German investment altogether in China is around the $100 billion mark. So cooperation and competition as well plays a role. I won't talk about the national debt and, and RMB internationalization, but to summarize it, so first in economy, for the Chinese leadership throughout the times, the first and most important thing was to make a living to their population in those extreme circumstances. If a leadership cannot provide for that, then they are gone, hence change of, of uh, ruling houses. In terms of defense or security, if a leadership fails to provide for the internal order, unity of order, and the external defense, that leadership will be gone. That's the second. And for that, they need a culture, a way of statecraft, regardless of whether it's called communist or liberal or Confucian. These are the musts for any leadership in China. And for that, the first and most important thing is that you need to have a identity. You need to have a concept of who you are. Now in China, 95% of the population is Han. And it has been the case over the centuries and thousands of years. So it's, it seems that for their mind, it's proven. Because the Han population, demographically, basically survived and kept up this uh, system. The fertility rate in China is still 1.7. Now, that compares to Japan's 1.2 or South Korea's 0.78. And China is not promoting childbearing. China was limiting childbearing. So there is something internal there that wants to grow. And actually, without families, you won't have a culture. You won't have a future without children. So first is identity. The second is self-determination. And the third is ability or, or capacity to act. And this is where we have this question in the field of technology, be that uh, civilian or military. That's a capacity and a big question, as Henry Kissinger put it the other day in The Economist, for what purposes, for what ends that capacity will be used? So I think while we have to look at how the US manages this artificial intelligence and, and the, all the consequences that, that new technology brings, we have to keep open channels to China to understand where they are going. Kissinger argued that there should be people formally and informally to sit together because if artificial intelligence is unleashed, then the whole humankind will be in trouble. So to summarize, back when Deng Xiaoping took the helm in, in China, there was a, a dream or hope that we in the West, we, we thought that market economy or capitalism is basically uh, the same as liberal democracy. 
China grew, as Deng Xiaoping said, it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice. So we have to revisit our idea whether capitalism and liberal democracy are really twins that cannot be separated. The Chinese example shows that it seems for a while it works. The lesson for us is, first of all, what are the ends for the technology? And the second is, who are the guardians of the guardians? In our Western world and in, our, in, in, in China as well. So to summarize, I think China is a monolithic empire based, built on meritocracy, Confucian type meritocracy. Huge organization and yes, there are checks and balances in there. It's not just that the uh, secretary of the party tells what to happen because the endpoints are too far away. And that's another feature. We believe that China is centralized. It's centralized in a way, but historically, it consisted of a network of independent, locally run places. In network science, we, we call it hubs. And if those local lords were not able to provide for internal security, order, and, uh, and well-being of the people, then they were gone. But no one can control a country so vast and so populous from one center. You have to read Fernand Brodel. He, he wrote a lot about this Cantonian uh, organization. So China consists of decentralized subcenters or hubs. And, and the name of the game is to keep the balance within and, and outside. So what next? I don't know. President Xi visited London in 2015. And uh, he spent five days in London. And at one of the functions, when he was asked, OK, and where China is going, he quoted Shakespeare, The Tempest. He said, what's the past is prologue to what to come. So I, I cannot stay here for the whole day, but I will have the transcript because I want to know what to come. So thank you very much for your attention and have a good conference.